is of his times. And when there were simpler times, he was a simpler guy. Batman really reflects what we're doing as a society. There's something in there that appeals to everybody. It's all valid. He kind of works no matter what you do with him. I'm a big Hitchcock fan. Hitchcock used to say that uh, he makes movies to give people a few healthy shocks. And I think kids deserve a few healthy shocks, you know. The more Batman became a figure of the night, a real vigilante, a guy who maybe did or didn't exist, who maybe was crazy, made it all the more real and all the more gritty. I think the audience definitely has matured and it's not just in what they're willing to accept, but also what they, what they expect. The character of Batman himself is universally accepted and beloved character. This guy is America's crime fighter. Batman is a weird character. He comes from a, a very dark place that we all relate to. We all have had wrongs against us that we wish we could somehow make right. And I think people relate to that. Although Superman started out in animation in the 1940s, Batman did not appear in animation until the 1960s when Filmation Studios produced the Batman cartoon series. Each animated version of Batman has kind of been a reflection of the times that they were produced in. Uh, for instance, the Filmation Batman came on the heels of the Adam West Batman, and it was still reflective of, of that because uh, the live-action Batman series had really established in the public's eye what Batman was. The live-action Batman series was very iconic. It just uh, blew the roof off when it came, came in. And that, of course, exploded the character in many ways, although that show was done kind of campy. Everything for like the next 20 years from that point on um, that was superhero-related was, you know, oh, it's kid stuff, or it's camp, or it's got to be, you know, tongue-in-cheek. And so by the time we get to uh, like the Filmation and the, and the Super Friends versions, uh, it really has very little relation to the dark brooding character that Batman began as. If you read the early Batmans that yeah, Bob Kane did, I mean, he has a gun, he kills people. I remember seeing him dropping somebody from an airplane or something like that. And by the time we got into the 60s, he had gone through a number of evolutions. Uh, Comic books had been censored during the 1950s, and so he, it became brighter and more sort of sci-fi in that. The first Batman cartoons, you know, done by Filmation, and then later by Hanna-Barbera as part of the Super Friends, were in the, the mold of the kind of superhero that Hanna-Barbera had pioneered for television. That was sort of the high point of Action for Children's Television, and there was this big movement that television should be good for kids. Characters not only couldn't hit, they couldn't make a fist. I mean, you might see a laser rifle that sends out whirling rays that maybe engulf someone in a bubble. And so you ended up with these very two-dimensional characters, you know, that they were good guys. And except for the colors of their costumes and their powers, all of the Super Friends were identical in their attitude. And if Batman had any uh, purpose in the Super Friends was that he was either a good leader or he was a detective or he had some gadgets that, they, that he could use when they got into trouble. If one looks at the comic books of 1969 and 1970 of Batman, it's the beginning of the, what we call now the Dark Knight. It's really, really great, serious stuff, completely opposite of what was on TV at that time. As Super Friends developed, some younger writers came in who were real comic book fans, uh, myself, Alan Burnett, um, a few others, and we really had a desire to try and bring some of what we were seeing in the comic books into it. Batman had been appearing in animation for about 20 years before you actually got the first, what many people consider to be, major Batman story, something that really reflected what Batman in the comics was. And that was an episode called The Fear that ran in Superpowers Galactic Guardians in the mid-1980s. That was the first stab anybody had taken in animation at really 
trying to get Batman back to Batman's roots to really explain or show in any way that he was a victim of, of crime when he was a kid. We wanted to do a more serious Batman. ABC did too. And so I wrote this story, which had to do with Batman following Scarecrow and the Scarecrow leading him down the very alley where his parents were killed, and Batman could not go down that alley. He was actually afraid of that alley. It just brought back everything. And the Scarecrow realized this and started to play on that. He didn't know why, what it was about this place that was bothering Batman, but he had he, he found a chink in the armor. So that was the basic story. And it went back to, um, to the origin of Batman and showing the parents getting shot and all that. And so it was a pretty serious half hour. And this is a remarkable achievement. He had a lot of trouble getting it through uh, standards and practices, but he felt strongly, and, and I think rightly so, that if you're going to do Batman, you have to get to the core of who Batman is. And I think it was a breath of fresh air for superhero fans who were watching because it was like a deliberate nod to them. It's like we're not denying the character. We are showing something from his past, and we are showing the important element uh, you know, that defined him in his past. And it was actually one of the first steps in taking Batman back out of the realm of children's entertainment and starting it towards the realm of entertainment for everyone. So Batman was always kind of stuck in the middle looking for some, you know, credible way to keep going as a, as a show. That image hung on and DC was trying to shake it because he wanted a more serious Batman, but it took Frank Miller to really shake it up and then Tim Burton. And that's talking, you know, 15, 20 years. By the time we got around to doing the Batman the Animated Series, fortunately, we were coming off of all, all the buzz of the, uh, the Tim Burton, the first Tim Burton movie. Tim Burton's movie was the first time that I had seen what I considered the real Batman, uh, again, not knowing his history from the comics or the fact that he was this soul vigilante and really dark and stealthy sort of character. Finally, we, we saw a movie where we got it. Oh, he's, he's dressed as a bat to scare the hell out of these criminals. That was the whole idea in the first place. None of us who have read comic books all our lives were that amazed because we knew that there was this untapped genre that the major studios hadn't really hit yet like they should. And Warner Brothers and Tim Burton did it. Tim Burton was, again, one of these sort of comic book geeks. He, he knew the material and he brought a much darker sensibility to it, which surprised a lot of people. That film with its designs and its tone, the, the way that it presented its hero and, and Gotham City was an entity all in and of itself, it really set the tone for what they were eventually going to do with Batman the Animated Series. It pretty much was the nail in the coffin of the campy Batman and no one, no one thought of, of camp anymore once they'd seen Tim Burton's movie. It, that worked great for us because that, that, that's, that's where our heads were at. We really wanted to do a you know more um, adult natured take on Batman. Not necessarily adult, because we, we certainly wanted the show to appeal to kids, but we wanted to be like almost like an all ages uh, appropriate you know, version of Batman. What are you doing? Stop it! Look at the Megan. Look at what you used to be. No, no, turn them off. I think the melding of the minds was we wanted to do something that was very much accurate and, and true to this very dramatic, uh, very dark sort of version of the character. So you don't go in buying, you know, a dark brooding uh, series based on this really successful movie and then change it and think that you're gonna have equal success. And they also wanted to do a stronger shows for children and to show elements of crime, of destruction, of kind of crazy super villains. We actually had fist fights and we actually had guns and we, it was great, <laughs> it was great. Batman the Animated Series walked that line so closely and so cleverly that it very quickly got adult fans and kid fans, and although they always edged right up to what was acceptable to show on television, uh, they did it in a way that it was still acceptable and they told incredible stories. The simple dynamic behind what we tried to use as the blueprint for the way we were gonna make these is considering them like miniature movies. They were gonna be self-contained stories that worked like a feature that had very much beginning, middle, and end, kept the character consistent, and always 
tried to preserve the fact that this is a character that's not going to, you know, he's going to be faced with different challenges, but he's never going to change his motivation. The danger we, we ran was not even so much in adult content, but we didn't want the show to get so talky and so dramatic that kids would just, you know, you know, their eyes would glaze over and they'd switch the channel. We wanted to do a serious show, and we wanted to cull the best from the comic books of the past. And so we took a little bit from the 40s and a little bit from the 50s and a little bit from the 60s and 70s. I mean, we just, we just took the best of Batman as we saw it. And uh, that's how that, that show was created. It was, it was created by comic book geeks. Because within Batman, it's, you've got, what is it, 70 years of history? It's like panning for gold. You've got, you know, some water and, and dirt in your, in your pan and you just sort of sift down and you find the little nuggets. Let's not forget that this series' biggest influence, if there is an influence, is the Tim Burton feature film. Uh, that's, that's the biggest influence. But, but really, in every other way, it's, it's not influenced by anything else except maybe those old Max Fleischer Superman cartoons. There's a little bit of that tone. Well, Fleischer Superman cartoons were certainly a big inspiration to the way we were going to approach the animation. But uh, the one film that probably had the biggest influence in, in terms of my contribution, which was the overall background styling and mood of the series, was The Godfather. And still imagine those shots of Marlon Brando in his office and having his interviews, where it, you can almost lift some of those scenes and directly relate them to some of the shots from, uh, from the Batman series. Pretty much everything I, I, I read that sort of even marginally skewed toward Batman, I wound up you know, bringing in and, and being inspired by a bit. And even, even some Disney stuff where, um, where Disney deals with elements of tragedy or action or, or a certain amount of life and death power in some of their movies. Theoretical approach to the background styling was from an um, illustrator named Bernie Fuchs who, who worked uh, quite a bit during the 70s. It was a technique that he used where would suggest a lot more detail than actually existed, but did it in such a way that every element that he added to, the, to his paintings, to his illustrations, mattered and and they would allow your imagination to fill in the blanks it, it was almost like watching a pastel a three-dimensional pastel image which they achieved by using black paper and and pastels with bruce and eric's new take on batman our studio was starting at a new place we were starting with black paper and this darkness and out of the darkness came the new vision of batman With the Batman series, it was a perfect example of keeping everything dark without having to paint it dark. It was, you know, we started off in the world of black and we just sort of lit it just like the nighttime works anyway. You turn off the lights and everything disappears, but when you turn them on, only the, you know, the leading edges of everything sort of stand out. So we tried to maintain that as much as we could. No one had ever seen an adventure cartoon that looked like that. It didn't look like anime. It didn't look like Johnny Quest. It was its own thing. I mean, those frames stand on their own as artwork. Individual frames, they're that good. We certainly wanted to incorporate our own new twists on the character. We wanted to make it unique to us. Bruce understood that animation shouldn't look realistic. If you're dealing in animation, why not exaggerate? And he did it. Detail was stripped down to a minimum. You'll notice the difference between Bruce Timm's Batman and the last Super Friends Batman. You'll notice it's mostly its line, its design, it's what they call line of action, where things are in a, in a circle or in a straight line in the way the character moves. In the past, with uh, superhero things, there was always a, a drive to try and make it look like the comic book with all of the articulation of the muscles and the flowing capes. And what happens is you can do a great model sheet of that, but it's really hard to move it. And so Bruce Timm realized that if we simplified it down to sort of like the base elements, that you could get the expression that you needed in order to tell the story but you also would make it so that it was simple enough to draw so that when you're doing thousands of drawings per episode that you'd be able to move it a lot more. They came up with a whole new language for how to animate a TV adventure cartoon. And that's, that's what got everybody excited. The fact that it was dark, 
that there was minimal music being used, that, that the actors were acting. Bruce, what can't be? Bruce, Bruce, you have failed me. I remember watching that opening for the first time ever. Yeah, that great music it was really dramatic, and the, the you know heavy shadows and everything. And there was a part where Batman's fighting guys on the roof, and he jumps on a guy and pounces on him, and ducks down, and then he rises, and the guy's out, and you don't know what he did to him. And that's that for me was like, oh, like they're doing things, they're doing things differently, more cinematic. The title cards were completely different for each episode. That was something that hadn't been done in TV animation. And I don't know if it was ever done in TV animation. It was certainly done in old theatrical cartoons. And that was, that's a little touch, but a little touches like that means something. One of the later episodes of Batman the Animated Series was directly tied into the comics in a major way in that not only did it adapt a comic story that had been done in the 1970s, it also directly looked at what the different artistic styles of Batman were in each, each of their stories. And occasionally we'd say, oh, yeah, let's have some fun. You know, we can't just be doom and gloom all the time, you know, skulking around in, in, in dark alleys, you know, versus guys, you know, trench coated guys with machine guns. We chose a segment from The Dark Knight that was, that was something that A, could stand alone in a six minute short, that it wasn't like part of the whole big, you know, tied so much into the whole big epic framework of that comic, but it was a real good distillation of kind of the nasty fun that Frank got up to in that comic. So you had a story in which you had giant typewriters and giant bowling balls, and then to contrast that, you had one of the storylines in which you saw the gritty, violent, super violent future of The Dark Knight Returns, and it was a really interesting take for that episode because it reflected all aspects of the comics, and then it went into what Batman the Animated Series is. Besides the look of the show, the other big difference between Batman the Animated Series and the shows that came before was its concentration in story terms on the psychology of the characters and what was going on. They went beyond that and they introduced things that the comics and later adapted, like the background for Mr. Freeze, who was just kind of a one-note guy with a freeze gun and, and a, a bubble helmet in the comics. And then they introduced the whole idea of his wife and you know, the reason for doing everything, um, to, to save his wife, to cure her, and, and that made that character so much more interesting. Same thing with Clayface, you know, they, they went to the actor route and they developed him and they introduced characters like Harlequin, who are now in the comic book. So I actually think that, that as much as the 89 Bat Batman film had influence on the animated series, the animated series had so much more influence on comic books. The biggest crossover character was Harley Quinn, who was a character that, that Paul Dini came up with. Uh, it, she was originally just supposed to be just a one-off, you know, hench girl for the Joker in one episode, but we all kind of really liked the character and, and Paul kept bringing her back. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's really cool when two mediums kind of, not necessarily feed off each other, but sort of like build from each other. And Harley Quinn, of course, you know, made a, a successful translation from the TV show into the comic books. Uh, she's now a, a pretty big part of the DC Universe. As you look at the evolution of Batman as an animated icon, it really has changed over the years, where you go from the, the comedy aspects up through the, the dark, brooding atmosphere of Batman the Animated Series. And since then, we've had various interpretations of Batman. We had a futuristic Batman with Batman Beyond. And there was a desire to change it and bring it, bring in a younger audience and make a younger Batman. The genesis was they were looking at what we were doing and they were saying, oh, this is way too adult, this is way too dark, we need a much much more kid-friendly version of it, we need one that has a younger protagonist, we need young teenage Batman. And the irony of it is that I think that we ended up with a series that was even darker than, than the previous versions of Batman in this sort of dystopian future where a lot of really bad things happen and this kid is thrown into it, again, under the tutelage of a very grumpy old Bruce Wayne. Then we brought Batman back on the Justice League, of course, and, uh, you know, where he was uh, basically part of a, a larger ensemble of, of superheroes and took the opportunity to redesign him again. It was kind of a, a little bit of a throwback to his original look in Batman the Animated Series. While we were working on the Justice League show, it was decided to, to dust Batman off as a solo property again. A brilliant young artist slash animation designer named Jeff Masuda was brought in to redesign the entire Batman world. New Frontier, in addition to being the story of the origin of the Justice League, is also a history of comics. 
viewed sort of from the inside. I think that Darwin wanted to explain why the costume had changed so much. Most recently, we've done the uh, the Batman Gotham Knight project, which was really kind of all over the place style-wise. Everything from like very modern kind of you know garage band punk style Batman to uh, you know real you know uber realistic, almost like rotoscope looking Batman, and uh, all, all different kinds of uh, variations in between. I think a project like Gotham Knight is the natural progression, and I think it's something we would have wanted to do. 15 years ago, but uh, the audience wasn't prepared. The uh, powers that be weren't prepared to step into that realm. We knew we were because we were the guys, not only fans of it, but we were the guys making it. For many years to come, we're going to be seeing further interpretations of, of the Batman because as a character, there's so much layering to him. And the fact that he is a character of darkness that fights for good is, leads to immeasurable story possibilities. By now, we all know that this guy is, uh, he's the real article. He's a, he's a hero and uh, he's, he's not gonna back down. And you know, we're living in strange, strange times where you, you don't believe your government, where you don't believe people commenting about the government, where you don't believe the corporations, where you, you feel like you're living in a world of mendacity. And this gives Batman even more power because he's that underground guy, the guy who is not playing by the rules, who will get to the truth no matter what.